Welcome to our continuing educational webinar series. I'm Katherine Short, Partnership Marketing Manager for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business. A hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility, and we help manage every aspect of a compliance program, and our training library provides hundreds of modules that are easy to assign and track. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Rachel V. Rose, JD, MBA, Principal with Rachel V. Rose, Attorney at Law, PLLC, Houston, Texas, and Don Barbo, Managing Director with VMG Health with us today. Ms. Rose has a unique background having worked in many different facets of healthcare, securities, and international law and business throughout her career. Her practice focuses on a variety of cybersecurity, healthcare, and securities law issues related to industry compliance and transactional work, as well as representing plaintiffs in Dodd-Frank False Claims Act whistleblower claims, which remain under seal. Ms. Rose holds an MBA with minors in healthcare and entrepreneurship from Vanderbilt University and a law degree from Stetson University College of Law, where she graduated with various honors, including the National Scribes Award and the William F. Blues Pro Bono Service Award. Ms. Rose is licensed in Texas. Currently, she is the chair of the Federal Bar Association's Government Relations Committee, the co-editor of the American Health Lawyers Association's Enterprise Risk Management Handbook for Health Care Entities, Second Edition, as well as co-author of the books, The ABCs of ACOs and What Are International Business Considerations? She has been named consecutively to the Texas Bar College, the National Women Trial Lawyers Association's Top 25, and Houstonia Magazine's Top 25 Lawyers for Healthcare. Ms. Rose is an affiliated member with the Baylor College of Medicine's Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy, where she teaches bioethics. Don Barbo is the Managing Director with VMG Health and leads the firm's litigation and disputes valuation practice. He has performed valuations exclusively for healthcare industry for over 20 years involving mergers and acquisitions, divestitures, partnership transactions, leasing arrangements, financial reporting matters, divorces, diminution of value, and commercial damages. His extensive healthcare valuation engagements have included hospitals, acute care, long-term care, critical access, behavioral health and surgical, physician practices, a variety of primary care and hospital-based, ambulatory surgical surgery centers, diagnostic imaging centers, cardiac catheter labs, pathology and clinical labs, cancer treatment centers, and dialysis centers. Mr. Barbo has also performed engagements for various contracts between hospitals and physicians, including medical director agreements, on-call agreements, lithotripsy center service agreements, professional service agreements, and management service agreements. Mr. Barbo also serves as an expert witness in litigation matters for his clients and has an extensive testifying experience in various state and federal courts and involving a wide range of issues, including whistleblower actions, breach of contracts, shareholder disputes, bankruptcy, and distressed businesses and marital divorces. He has spoken extensively to various legal and valuation organizations and has published articles regarding healthcare business valuation issues. Prior to his valuation career, he served as the CFO for a physician practice management company that provides management services to a variety of physician practices. Before that, he served as the controller financial officer for various emerging companies. He began his professional career as an auditor with a big four national accounting firm. Mr. Barbo is a CPA, holds the accreditation in business valuation from the AICPA, is a member of the MGMA, and a member of the um, Health, Healthcare Financial Management Association. He also served on the Technical Advisory Board for the AICPA Forensics and Valuation Section Consulting Digest, and the Financial Valuation and Litigation Expert Newsletter. He holds a 
BBA in Accounting from Texas Tech, and an MBA from the Cox School of Business, Southern Methodist. Before we begin, I would like to mention at First Healthcare Compliance, we strive to serve as a trusted resource for compliance professionals, and every month we celebrate their hard work and dedication with our Compliance Super Ninja re recognition. Today, our team is turning the spotlight on Super Ninja Jean Basford, Human Resources Generalist at Maine Nephrology Associates. Jean says, I love working for a medical practice with such caring staff and both clinical and non-clinical. We all work hard to make things run as smoothly as possible so our providers can give the best possible care to our patients. Congratulations, Jean. Our team is honored to have the privilege of working with you. A copy of the slides is about available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions into the question box on your control panel during the presentation. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Your PACOM and PMI CEU certificates will be emailed to you following the presentation. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advan Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. So Rachel and Don, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure, thank you. Thank you too, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. To Thank you. Okay, Don, are we ready to present on valuations and commercial reasonableness in the era of the new Stark law and anti-kickback statute final rules? Absolutely, Rachel. Let's get this party started. All right. So no presentation is complete without a disclaimer and the informa information presented is not meant to constitute legal advice. Please consult your attorney for advice on a specific situation. Don, do you have anything to add to that before we go into the red highlights? No, I think that covers it. Okay, the information presented is current as of the date of the initial presentation. Participants are encouraged to check government and other relevant websites for the most up-to-date information. So today we're going to discuss the new AKS and Stark final rules. So first, we're going to begin with a brief overview of Stark and the anti-kickback statute. From there, we'll delve into the new final rules, including value-based arrangements, cyber donations, and fair market value. From there, we'll transition, and Don will give you some finance fodder, which is critical for, I would say, the trifecta of items that we find specifically in the Stark Law with fair market value, general market value, and commercial reasonableness. From there, we'll delve into fair market value, referrals based on volume and value, and commercially reasonable. Specifically, any changes to these definitions, how they apply to the new final rules, our collective experiences and why these terms are still important. Finally, we will segue into the False Claims Act, which is an area that both Don and I have extensive experience with, just coming at it from a different vantage point. And we're very fortunate to have Don, who has served as an expert witness on both sides of the aisle during several cases, including serving as the government's expert in the Forest Park case, which he'll be able to speak about throughout the presentation. And finally, we'll have some compliance tips and conclude the presentation from there. So Don, do you wanna take the first slide? Uh, sure. So the, the, the new rules and regulations that, that were issued uh, provided some additional color into uh, various comments and the government's responses to those comments. Um, 
and and this of course deals with the AKS statue or the, or the anti kickback statue, um, and also the Stark Law, um, which have been I guess around for a number of years. And under the AKS statute, there are a number of safe harbors that the government provides. And under the Stark Law, there are a number of exceptions. So it, it's important in working, of course, with your legal advisors to, to fully understand how your arrangement may fit within the various uh, safe harbors or uh, exceptions. Um, and Rachel, do you want to bring your legal expertise to provide any additional comments on that, on those two? Laws. Sure, absolutely. As Don noted, these are two of the most fundamental anti-fraud laws that we have in the healthcare industry. And the AKS goes back to 1972, so it is definitely not new. And then the Stark Law itself, as the slide indicates, was originally enacted in 1989 by California Congressman Pete Stark. And there were, were several steps to the Stark Law. Initially, Stark One was promulgated, and it primarily focused on the prohibition of physicians from referring patients to laboratories in which they had a financial interest. And then from there, a few years later in 1993, Stark II came about, and the term designated health services, which is specific to the START law, was expressly defined as well as the types of designated health services. From there, CMS promulgated regulations for both Stark 1 and Stark 2 in three distinct phases, and it was meant to be almost like Tetris in a building block where once phase one was implemented, phase two was built on top of it, and then phase three. And all of these phases, when complete, were meant to be read together. Before the new final rule, we did have some general exceptions, and the Stark term is exception. The anti-kickback statute term is safe harbor. So those are two terms just to bear in mind throughout the presentation because they're specific to each law. But in general, exceptions that fall under Stark were physician services, in-office ancillary services, prepaid plans, intrafamily rural referrals, and academic medical centers. Notably, what Don and I see from a litigation standpoint is that many states have laws that are similar to the Stark Law and or the anti-kickback statute that prohibit kickbacks and or restrict physician self-referrals. And Texas is no exception. In fact, their laws are very robust. So here, Don and I have compiled a chart, which actually we poached it from CMS, and it gives a great overview of some of the key differences between the Stark Law and the anti-kickback statute. So if we begin with what's prohibited in general, as you can tell by the screen, the anti-kickback statute is much broader in its scope. It prohibits offering, paying, soliciting, or receiving anything of value to induce or reward referrals or general federal health care program business. By way of contrast, the Stark Law prohibits a physician from referring Medicare patients for designated health services to an entity with which the physician or immediate family member has a financial relationship unless an exception applies. It also prohibits the designated health services entity from submitting claims to Medicare for those services resulting from a prohibited referral. And for those of you who are involved in the claim submission process or the initial step of getting a provider on board with CMS to actually render care to Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. Basically, whenever a 
provider and there are different types of forms. There are 855, CMS form 855, and then there's A and B and other ones, but A is for a hospital, B is typically for an individual physician. And the language that is consistent throughout those forms is that the provider is submitting the claim without violating the anti-kickback statute and Stark law, as well as other relevant laws. Now, I just paraphrase that, but it's important to note from a False Claims Act standpoint that that is expressly stated not only when the provider is signing up with CMS, but also whenever, for example, a CMS Form 1500 is submitted, similar language appears on that form and the provider actually attests that the claims that they're submitting are free of false and fraudulent statements and do not run afoul from the Stark and anti-kickback statute. Don, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, excellent overview, Rachel. The only couple of things that I would add is that um, myself and my firm, BMG Health, we're not attorneys, we're certainly not a law firm, but our valuations need to be consistent with the relevant healthcare laws and regulations. So we pay particular attention to the AKS and the Stark law uh, definitions of fair market value, commercial reasonableness, um, and now volume and value considerations. And Rachel mentioned that I testified for the government in the Forest Park Medical Center matter, an additional law that was implicated in that matter that the government brought forward was the Travel Act. And to not go overboard on that, but perhaps to put that on your radar screen that the Travel Act uh, was, was implicated in that the government uh, believed that there were violations of state law involving interstate commerce. Um, so that was another uh, angle, if you will, that the government pursued in that matter. Don, that's an excellent case to bring up, and thank you for doing so. What's interesting also about the Forest Park case is it was the second time that the Travel Act was utilized in a healthcare case by the United States Department of Justice. The first time it was utilized was in a case in New Jersey. And the second aspect of that is that the claims involved in that case while they would have typically implicated the Stark and anti-kickback statute, they were actually either cash or commercial payers. But the Travel Act provided the government with a tool to reach that conduct because, Don, you were there in person. It was considered so egregious, and the kickbacks were so flagrant that the government couldn't turn a blind eye to it. Yeah. Correct. And in the Forest Park business model, it was built basically upon non-government uh, payers, uh, predominantly focused on commercial, although some government patients did fall through the cracks. But to the egregious nature of particularly the marketing services agreements that I testified to, um, the, the, the business did run afoul of uh, and it was proven in court of kickbacks and bribes involving even commercial patients. So it's if the government sees conduct that is grossly egregious, they will use all the tools in their toolbox to go after them. A couple of other notable items related between Stark and AKS. So AKS, the referrals can be from anyone with Stark, it's specifically from a physician. Items and services, it's any item or service versus Stark is that specific definition of designated health services. Intent, whenever I approach something, and Don, you may do this from the valuation side as well, I always start with the anti-kickback statute because our two boxes here, the intent and the penalties, AKS can carry criminal penalties, and really the bar doesn't get much higher than that, as we all know. So I always make sure that clients are compliant with the AKS first, 
And then I look into the Stark Law, which is known as the strict liability statute, almost like speeding. If you go, if you break it, then you're you could be held liable. It's also civil only in nature, and there are no criminal penalties associated with the Stark Law. Don, is there anything you'd like to add about that? Uh, I, I don't think so, and and I agree. Given the uh, the broader reach of the AKS, I think it does make sense to perhaps start with that and then move on to the the Stark Law um, uh, exceptions that are more narrow and focused. Perfect. And then we have what we know as exceptions under the Stark Law and their safe harbors. And one notable item there is that you have to make sure that you're fitting squarely into an AKS safe harbor and a Stark Law exception. There are other laws as well which actually overlap. One is the Eliminating Kickbacks and Recovery Act, which is known as ECRA. And that also is criminal or civil in nature. But that law specifically references the AKS safe harbors and has additional safe harbors as well. So if you're in the drug treatment space, you should act actually look at that law very closely too. And then finally, when we get into federal health care programs, the AKS covers all. The Stark Law is primarily Medicaid. I have seen cases where, or Medicare, sorry. I have seen cases where Medicaid is also implicated, and that's not surprising because Medicaid dollars emanate from the federal government, and then it's a pretty much a joint venture, so to speak, between the states and the federal government. And as Don indicated, there are a lot of state laws that also need to be considered along those lines. Don, anything else before we move on? The only other comment I have, do, do you have much experience uh, with OIG advisory opinions in terms of filing them or requesting one and getting response back? Oh, that's a great point. So. Under the anti-kickback statute, what Don is referring to is what's known as an OIG opinion. And that is where an individual entity will submit a scenario to HHS OIG, typically a lawyer does it, and says, we're considering this arrangement and we would like to know whether or not it would implicate liability under the anti-kickback statute. CMS is the government agency that has jurisdiction over the Stark Law and there's a similar process there. A couple of items of note that whenever these OIG advisory opinions come out, they're great to review, but the outcome, as expressly stated in those opinions, only applies to the entity that requested that opinion. Don, what has your experience been with those? Uh, we, we definitely read and follow them and um, think it certainly provides insights into the, how the OIG breaks down an arrangement and provides, I think, uh, valuable insights into their thinking, and uh, and also they they don't issue fair market value opinions, um, but they can in, in essence provide commentary on if they think the uh, subject arrangement might trip up you know, you know the various healthcare laws and regulations. So we we do read and study those. Absolutely. And as an attorney, that's a great guidepost, too, because it's almost as if HHS, OIG, sometimes they're very express. Another notable item was a couple of years ago, they actually repealed an advisory opinion, which rarely happens. But it's just something to be aware of as well, that HHS, OIG does have the ability to do that. So new portions of the new final rules. This is the moment I know everyone has been waiting for. And the reason we chose to use this, again, CMS 
diagram is because it highlights what are known as value-based programs. And as you can tell by the two lines here, at the top you have legislation passed, and on the bottom you have the program that was implemented. And in 2010, we get to the Affordable Care Act. And as you can see here, we have four different types of value-based programs being implemented that actually relate to the Affordable Care Act. And those are the hospital value-based purchasing programs, the hospital readmissions reduction programs, hospital acquired conditions, as well as the value modifier or physician value-based modifier. And then whenever we kind of jump ahead, we get in to the Protecting Access to Medicare Act. And the correlation there is the Skilled Nursing Facility Value-Based Program, which in some ways is similar to the Hospital Value-Based Program. And then finally, we have MACRA. And Don, I'm sure that comes up quite a bit in um, discussions that you may have with providers, just given the nature of the impact on physician payments and provider payments. Correct. Uh, all of these, uh, well, <laughs> healthcare is obviously such a dynamic and critical um, area, and, and it's huge. I mean, almost 20% of our GDP is spent on healthcare. It, it, it's a very large and a and very fragmented, highly regulated business. And um, being on the valuation side of the equation, it's challenging yet also almost, uh, I guess, thrilling, if you will, to, to try to read and understand these various value-based programs and attempt to value them because they can certainly be a challenge in that they're getting away from the traditional fee for service you do a service, you get paid for it. Well, that's a fairly black and white business model compared to some of these value-based programs and value-based enterprises that I think are very important. They're uh, things that parties can collaborate on to ultimately benefit the patients. So uh, yes, they're, they're, they're wonderful, but they're also very challenging and particularly you know, when they're being phased in, um, it's it's it, it, it's a good opportunity for I think the, the healthcare industry and then the various consultants and advisors to the healthcare participants. What's interesting, building on what Don said, was that Don mentioned the value-based enterprises and arrangements that we're going to delve into. We would ask that you bear some of these concepts in mind because they can be a critical component to establishing the governing document and the quality outcomes that are required under both the new Stark and AKS final rules. So what are the goals of the new rules? As Don mentioned, it basically is this model shift and mentality shift too, away from quantity and onto quality. So it encourages alignment of incentives along the end-to-end -end entire care continuum. Also improve incentives for providers to collaborate and encourage patient involvement. And finally, advancing the transition and removing barriers to value-based care and the coordination of care under both government and commercial insurance programs. For those of you who participated in ACOs, part of this process is very similar, as well as ACOs having what are known as waivers, which are similar to the AKS safe harbors and the Stark exceptions, so long as all of the requisite elements are met. What Don and I have discussed in the past is that before providers and other entities could not even have certain conversations because it really would have run afoul of both AKS and the Stark Law right off the bat without having the protections of certain types of entities. 
Don, would you like to expand on that? Um, you know, I think we'll get into some of that a little bit later, but but completely uh, agree that um, if you're trying to collaborate with independent parties, independent in that you're not part of a overall company or subsidiary or affiliate, that um, that it can be a challenge from a business standpoint to uh, to collaborate and share data and share in uh, bonus arrangements whenever you're basically independent of each other. Um, so I, I, I think the, these new rules and regulations provide a, a wonderful opportunity to help mitigate some of those risks. Perfect. The statement by HHS is pretty profound. As they stated in the proposed rule, CMS believes that clear, bright line rules would enhance both stakeholder compliance efforts and the CMS enforcement capability. CMS also believes that the policies finalized in the final rule will provide clarity that will benefit the regulated industry, CMS, and other law enforcement partners. As Don and I will reveal down the line, not everything is quite clear and bright line, but I think, Don, that it was definitely helpful in resolving some ambiguous issues that had been in place for quite some time. Right, agreed. So general value-based arrangements, basically, again, these are exceptions and safe harbors that will provide protection for qualified financial arrangements. And that's a key term between participants in both government and commercial value-based program arrangements. It's also very important to note that the value-based arrangement exceptions do not apply to financial arrangements between payers and providers, but rather to the financial relationships between and among value-based arrangement participants and value-based participant program entities. So basically, Don, do you want to take this slide? I think this is really key, the next two slides, in terms of who would qualify as a VBE participant. And on the valuation side, wouldn't that be one of the first questions you would want to know? Sure, so one of our first steps in valuing an arrangement, it sounds fundamental, but one of our first steps is to get our arms around the business model itself and then understanding the, the cash flow and the, we call them the value drivers. So what are the fundamentals of driving that cash flow? We also, since we're not attorneys, we, have, we make the overall assumption that the arrangement is legally permissible. Um, otherwise, you know, the, it, it, we, we wouldn't value a company that, for whatever reason, was an illegal arrangement. Um, so having said all of that, that's why it's very important that we work with the legal advisors to the arrangement and that we understand uh, the business model and uh, how applicable exceptions and safe harbors are met. So my, my understanding is that the, the Stark law permits a pretty wide range of parties that are allowed to be the quote VBE participant um, as opposed to the AKS that specifically excludes certain participants as Rachel's slide here kind of uh, shows uh, pretty clearly. Uh, I don't know if we want to walk through each of those types of businesses, Rachel, but um, we, I'll leave that up to you. I think one of the key items is that this is where Stark and the anti-kickback statute really diverge. So what is permissible under the Stark law in that the definition of a VBE participant does not exclude any specific persons, entities, or organizations from qualifying as a VBE participant. 
that's the Stark rule. However, the AKS does have what are known as the ineligible entity list. And that was the first paragraph that we just saw on the previous slide. And it's not uncommon for CMS and OIG to cross-reference each other. So this is where going back to that chart where Don and I both agreed, we start with the AKS statute. This is when you would know right off the bat, well, I can't have pharmaceutical manufacturers, distributors, or wholesalers. I cannot have pharmacy benefit managers, laboratory companies, compounding pharmacies, manufacturers of devices or medical supplies, entities or individuals that sell DME POS. But there is a caveat here, which is very important other than a pharmacy or a physician provider or other entity that primarily furnishes services, all of which remain eligible, referred to generally throughout the preamble as DME POS companies and medical device distributors or wholesalers. And some of you may be familiar with what are known as physician-owned distributorships. I always advise my clients to stay away from those like the plague because that has been an area of interest for HHS, OIG. We've seen criminal action occur in False Claims Act cases related to physician-owned distributorships. And the Senate committees have actually held hearings on this issue. So that's one that I always recommend my clients be clear of. Don, do you have anything to add on this? Uh, no, but I do agree with your concerns about the physician-owned distributorships or pods. So here are just the reference points for the Starkline AKS. Both of these became effective January 19th of 2021 almost every provision of each of these. There are a couple that come into effect later, but in general, the effective date is January 19th of 2021. We have the federal register sites listed for both, and under Stark, VBE participants are broadly defined with no exceptions, which is what we just honed in on, and there are new exceptions that apply. Under the AKS safe harbors, we're looking specifically here at the VBE entities as well as cyber donations. And then again, VBE participants, you cannot overlook the ineligible list. So here are some crucial value-based definitions. A value-based enterprise means two or more VBE participants collaborating to achieve at least one value-based purpose, each of which is a party to a value-based arrangement with the other or at least one other VBE participant in the value-based enterprise that have an accountable body or person responsible for the financial and operational oversight of the value-based enterprise and that have a governing document that describes the value-based enterprise and how the VBE participants intend to achieve its value-based purposes. A VBE participant is a person or entity that engages in at least one value-based activity as part of its value-based enterprise. And a value-based purpose means any of the following coordinating and managing the care of a target patient population, improving the quality of care for a target patient population, appropriately reducing the cost to or growth for expenditures, or transitioning from a healthcare delivery model based on the volume of services, so quantity, towards that quality of care, cost control, and coordination of care. So what are some items that are critical to include? And this is where 
uh, Don and I are definitely on the same page as we are on most things, but definitely here, even though the value-based enterprise does not necessarily need to be a separate legal entity with independent contracting power, depending on the sophistication of, and the size of the VBE, it may be prudent to do so. Also, because of the potential valuation issues and the impact on finance and accounting, this is where utilizing very sophisticated consultants and valuation experts like Don is absolutely critical. Don, do you wanna expand upon that? Um, maybe just from a standpoint of it's in important, I, I guess I mentioned earlier that when we're doing evaluation, it's important to understand the, the business model itself, and that certainly extends to the underlying governing documents in terms of voting rights, who has control, what are the permitted buy-ins and buy-outs, um, which goes to the liquidity of the underlying investment or the illiquidity of it, as well as control or lack of control. Uh, so not only are those important in terms of understanding the ongoing governance of the business, but also uh, upon transactions involving ownership units or even liquidating the entity, um, which are all important to, to set forth in the governing document and certainly has valuation ramifications. That's an excellent point. And again, depending on the sophistication of the parties, that might be something that could be referenced or an amendment to their own operating documents to indicate that a VBE exists as well. Mm -hmm. So items to include in value-based arrangements. Well, as Don just highlighted the governing document, and these are some items that need to be in the governing document in order to indicate its legitimacy. Identify a person or group that oversees the financial and operational aspects of VBE. Along those lines, I would recommend indicating who has contracting authority and who can speak on behalf of that organization. List value-based participants after checking that there is no person from the AKS in eligible list. Identify the value-based purpose. And a value-based purpose may be one of the programs which we highlighted earlier on the screen that came out of the Affordable Care Act and other laws, such as the reduction of hospital-acquired conditions or value-based purchasing initiatives. You need to identify the target population and it needs to be focused. It cannot be all people over 65. It cannot just target a specific insurer. So for example, if you were creating a VBE, an example may be diabetics. And so what you could use would be uh, hemoglobin A1C baselines and then looking at whether or not they're checking their blood sugars, or you could use weight as a measure for that. And from there, you need to get into how the objectives are going to be achieved, tracked, and monitored. And finally, identify what value-based programs are already in play, as well as, as Don mentioned, really either cross-referencing the operating agreements, which are already in place, or you may even have to create a new operating agreement depending on how the VBE is created. Don? Agree with all of those points. Would probably add not only from a valuation compliance perspective, but also just good general business practices. Since you're involving multiple parties and entities in these arrangements, I would suggest having valuations done on various contractual arrangements. Some of these arrangements, if they involve management services agreements or lease agreements for use of a facility um, or various compensation arrangements, if the medical directorships or whatever may be involved, I would certainly suggest having those looked at for valuation purposes as well. 
That's an excellent point, Don. And from my perspective, I think a valuation expert should be used in every facet of healthcare. So now I'm I'll going argue, to I'll turn. <laughs> Well, from a compliance standpoint, and when we talk about risk mitigation, I think that it is imperative. And as an attorney, I would not want to construct a contract not knowing that I was perhaps overlooking something that would either reduce my client's risk, would be visible, demonstrable evidence that I could provide to the government in the event that a False Claims Act suit emerged, or just to know that I'm keeping it within the navigational beacons. Right. Okay, Don, this is all, all you on the finance and accounting. So I'll leave it up to you to hit all of these bullets and then tell me when you're ready to move the slide. Sure, thank you, Rachel. So we could spend an entire course on a number of these accounting and finance basics. So all I'm gonna do is highlight and uh, summarize a number of core concepts that we think, that Rachel and I think uh, are important to understand in the context of, of performing valuations of various healthcare arrangements. Um, so maybe just starting with the basics in explaining an income statement, which is also known as a profit and loss statement, and it goes to the operating performance of an entity versus the balance sheet, which goes to the financial position of an entity, and then the statement of cash flows, which is kind of a self-describing statement in that it shows here are the sources and uses of cash flows. Um, so the, the income statement itself then would show revenues and expenses and we actually on the next slide, which we'll get to in a moment, we'll show the differences and kind of compare and contrast. Um, the second bullet here is accrual versus cash basis financials. And just to provide a summary compare and contrast, accrual financials are uh, consistent with generally accepted accounting principles, also known as GAAP. And accrual goes to uh, the timing of when revenues and expenses are recognized. So revenues are recognized when the underlying services or products have been uh, sold or delivered under the terms of the arrangement. Um, as opposed to cash basis revenues, they're recognized at the time cash is actually received. So on an income statement that's cash basis, you wouldn't see bad debt expense because if, if uh, and a receivable is written off, well, it's never recorded as cash uh, revenue to begin with. Um, also on the expense side, accrual-based financials recognize expenses when the expense is incurred, as opposed to on a cash basis, it's when the expense is actually paid. So the, the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board that sets the standards for the profession, um, basically believe that cash basis financials can be somewhat manipulated uh, and they fail on what's called the matching principle. The matching principle is to match the expenses that are associated with generating the revenue. Uh, under accrual based, you have that matching principle in place. Under the cash basis financials, you don't because it's all based on when cash is received and when uh, expenses are paid, which may be deferred out or could even be prepaid. Um, now, having said all of that, uh, the IRS certainly allows both forms of accounting for income tax purposes, either accrual or cash basis. Uh, now that frowns upon flipping and flopping between the two and there are various rules on that issue. Uh, but that's the difference between accrual and cash basis. Uh, now, I will also add that cash basis is financials are not GAAP compliant, meaning if you had an auditor that came out and audited the books and records of the company that kept their financials on a cash basis, they would uh, not be able to say they're consistent with GAAP, which might be a problem if you have bankers, lenders, and other stockholders that are requiring GAAP-based financials. Uh, the term mark to market is the concept of 
uh, financial statements based on GAAP record assets and liabilities at their historical cost, um, which might over time vary from the current market uh, value of the assets. So uh, marking to market would, is a process to uh, restate the underlying assets and liabilities at a market value arrangement. Uh, as opposed to its historical cost. Um, and that could be done for various purposes, predominantly in, uh, in the event one company buys another company, then the acquired company's assets are, are marked to market at that point to record them on the books of the, acqui of the acquiring company. Uh, GAP versus non-GAP, we, we kind of covered that to some degree in the difference between accrual-based versus cash basis financials. That's probably the, the high level takeaway on that. Proformance budgets and projections, uh, those um, are in addition to the financial uh, statements um, of, of a company and, and proformas are oftentimes prepared in terms of management maybe providing what their outlook on a normalized basis of operations that might uh, look at things without um, recording non-recurring or discretionary items. So it's kind of a window of what they believe normalized operations may look like on a go forward. And budgets and projections kind of speak for themselves. It's management's outlook for the future. Uh, there are, in essence, uh, the last bullet, the differences between audited, reviewed, and compiled financials basically starts, it, it's, well, it's a, high, it's a hierarchy going to the reliability of the underlying financial. So at the top of that hierarchy would be audited financials in which an audit firm has come in and examined the books and records and determined whether they are compliant with GAAP or not. Uh, reviewed is a step down from audited financials in that not all of the procedures uh, are performed in performing a reviewed engagement, which review is a defined term in the GAAP world. Um, and then compiled are the lowest level of financials in terms of reliability in that an audit firm is not doing any audit or review services. They're just, in essence, taking the the financials as compiled, generally compiled from say a general ledger and and preparing financials for the company. Uh, and oftentimes those lack the underlying footnotes that a company audited and reviewed footnotes that are, are, are critical uh, to explain and support the financials. In, in compiled financials, oftentimes those notes and footnotes are omitted. So Rachel, if we could go to the next slide. Absolutely, Don. I just have one inquiry, and that is, should entities just take at face value what they see, or should they ask for kind of what's behind the curtain, meaning the contra accounts and the ledgers? Yes, that's an excellent question. And let me start with um, what you're going to looking behind the curtain gets into the financial due diligence world where in, instead of accepting financials at face value, there's additional diligence performed on the financials that are not considered audit services, but are additional procedures done to analyze the financials and, and may even go well beyond just um, just what we call ticking and tying them back to underlying uh, source documents. It, a lot of times, so I, within VMG, we have a group that specializes in doing financial due diligence services. A lot of the times it starts with converting cash basis financials to accrual based financials to provide uh, in, in a lot of cases, a better picture of the company's operations. Uh, but looking at the underlying, to your point, uh, contra accounts and general ledgers, goes to understanding, well, what is the basis that these financials are built upon? Because financials are, in general terms, uh, summarized financial performance of an entity. The building blocks of that would be the general ledgers and, and sometimes even underlying journal entries. And then even going further would go to the underlying source documents, which could be invoices, uh, checks, and disbursements, and things that were involved in creating the accounting transaction itself. Um, 
but from a valuation perspective, there's there's usually very limited financial due diligence that's performed, although we do look to see if there's odd behavior or trends in the underlying financials. Um, now then, looking at the differences between a balance sheet and an income statement, again, a balance sheet to start with goes to the financial position of the asset. So it's a snapshot in time as of the balance sheet date. So assume December 31 is the year end of the entity. It would be a snapshot of the assets, liabilities, and equity accounts at that point in time. Um, and what links the balance sheet to the income statement is an account called, in essence, retained earnings, which the net uh, earnings of the company flows into the balance sheet into the equity section via the retained earnings account. So there's definitely a linkage between the two statements. The income statement um, is a, a snapshot of the company's operations over a period of time. So a, a financial as of December 30, or an income statement as of December 31 would be for the 12 months ended uh, December 31, say 2020, and it looks at the revenues and expenses that the company uh, generated over that time period. If we could go to the next slide. Absolutely. We wanted to show some of the more common operating uh, margins and, and, and accounts that we generally see um, on the financial statement. So it's kind of starting at the top of the list, the gross profit margin is uh, the net revenues less the cost of goods sold would equal the gross profit and then the gross profit margin is a percentage which is the calculation of the gross profits divided by sales of the company uh, the next one below that is the operating profit margin that is generally defined as the income from operations divided by the net sales and it so it, it, it the operating margin versus the gross profit margin, the operating margin would capture uh, the underlying operating expenses that are associated with generating sales. So that could be uh, general administrative expenses, marketing expenses, administration expenses, whereas gross profit is just sales less cost of goods sold. And in a lot of position practices uh, that the, the gross profit margin uh, where you don't necessarily have specific cost of goods sold uh, might in essence be the same or, or, or would in essence be uh, probably 100%, uh, but then the operating profit margin in that case would be more meaningful, of course. Uh, EBITDA is the third uh, level of profitability. EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. This is a very commonly used level of operating performance of healthcare businesses because it in essence goes to the company's ability to produce uh, earnings that are then available to pay for debt service, for taxes, as well as to uh, provide funds available for capital expenditures to reinvest back into the business. In essence, the EBITDA takes out the capital structure of the business, meaning uh, whether you have zero debt or a million dollars of debt, uh, here's what the earnings would look like prior to the capital structure of an entity. And so it can put entities on more of a level playing field and comparing one entity to the next without regard to their capital structure. The, the, the fourth level of profitability is the overall net profit margin, which is basically the bottom line net income divided by net sales. We could go on to the next slide. Uh, valuation methodologies, again, this could be a whole session in and of itself, so I'm just going to just highly summarize. Um, so under uh, our USPAP, which is a Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice Valuation Standards, there are three approaches that should be considered. It doesn't mean all three are actually performed, but at least three approaches should be considered for any valuation those being the cost, market, and income approaches. And this is to just summarize, but the cost approach 
values a business. Actually, the cost approach is also known as the asset based approach. The, the, the cost approach would the fundamental concept there is that the value of a company is based on the sum of its identifiable, tangible and intangible assets. The market based approach, the concept is that the business you're attempting to value that the business should be based on observable mar uh, multiples that you can find in the marketplace for the same or similar type of business. Think of that as maybe real estate or even uh, cars um, or other assets that have publicly available pricing information. The third approach is the income approach. The concept under that approach is that the value of a business is equivalent to or is based on the net present value of its future cash flows. And those can be done either for a single period um, or for a multi-period scenario. Uh, and, and whether one approach or all three are relevant for any particular valuation just simply goes to the facts and circumstances associated with that business. Usually uh, growing companies that have a history and that are profitable, you would typically lean more towards an income-based approach uh, and or a market approach for companies that are more asset heavy. Think of real estate holding companies or early stage companies that don't have a history of, of operations. Um, perhaps you might lean more towards a cost or asset-based approach. Um, and then of course, as we already mentioned, we certainly do these with considerations for fair market value and commercial reasonableness under Stark and AKS. So if we could go to the next slide. Absolutely. Um, so, and actually, Rachel, I'm happy to speak to this slide unless you want to take over from here on the commenters, commenters and, and CMS's response to them regarding valuation issues. Would you like for me to speak to that? Or I would. I'll just take the broad bullet at the bottom, and then if you can delve into more of the specifics, because this is the valuation side, that would be great. Basically, CMS declined to give specific guidance because the determination of fair market value and general market value will vary depending on the circumstances. And given the background that Don just articulated, there are a lot of legitimate ways to value different types of transactions. So it's not surprising that CMS declined to pigeonhole or only give one specific type of fair market value or general market value that would work. Don? Correct. Correct, and that's a great intro. So as most professions, um, valuations are certainly it's an art and a science and i think the art goes to the professional judgment that an appraiser can bring to the matter uh the science is i referenced use path uh which are our industry standards to follow as well as other fundamental accounting and finance uh known requirements that's more on the science side. So uh, valuations is a wonderful blend of the art and science coming together. And I think CMS in their wisdom acknowledges that, that it is an art and a science, particularly whenever you're talking about business models, some that are yet to be created, but that under a VBE or VBA arrangement, Here's a core concept or the nature of it, but how parties actually structure it and then execute it, who in their right mind, you know, could visualize what those would look like. So instead of, to use Rachel's wonderful term, instead of pigeonholing and providing some bright line uh, guidance, which CMS in their, in their prior definition actually did that, which we'll get to here in a moment, uh, but in their new definition of general market value have taken out some of that language, uh, as well as I think in one of the proposed rules, they had proposed having um, a type of a safe harbor that used an average of various compensation surveys. That also was something that they eliminated because of issues around that. 
so uh, that I think again, this stresses the importance of how valuations should be uh, based on the facts and circumstances of the subject transaction, which I think that's another change that CMS has now embedded in the definition of general market value is that it should be specific to the given transaction, not just a hypothetical, but specific to the transaction, which frankly, we advocate, we being VMG, we advocate and perform valuations under that uh, concept all along. We've always done that, that uh, it's important to understand and value what's put before you, not some hypothetical arrangement that may or may not be the case. Um, okay, so if we could move on to the next slide. Sure, now we're into the changes in fair market value and commercial reasonableness, and we also touch on general market value as well. Don? Sure, so to summarize the difference between the two, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna read them verbatim, but the IRS definition at the top there are some very similar characteristics to the general market value definition provided under Stark, with the exception that the IRS definition does not uh, bright line or call out um, the referral relationship that may exist between parties. Um, whereas under the general market value definition of Stark, it certainly um, has the requirement that uh, transactions between parties and referring relationship um, should not really be be used because it can taint that um, that that outcome if the value somehow has incorporated uh, the value for referrals. Um, so that that is kind of comparing contrasting the IRS to the general market value. The primary difference again has to do with referrals being omitted from the IRS definition. Now, we, when we do almost all of our valuations, we will give consideration, we being B&G, to both definitions because we have a number of clients that are in the not-for-profit world, and it's important that the valuation is also consistent with the IRS requirements. Um, anything and, else you'd like to add? And to in that? healthcare, mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say, Don, you raise an excellent point because in healthcare, there are a lot of health systems and other entities which are actually not for profit. Correct. Correct. So moving on, we, Don and I uh, poached again the <laughs> this great chart of the new definitions of fair market value under the Stark final rule. And Don, do you just want to hit a couple of the highlights on this? Sure. So the highlight, I think, is number one, that there are, there's three columns here for a purpose, that uh, there is now a definition that goes to general use for fair market value transactions, then also for the rental of equipment, and then the third is for the rental of office space, and but what's consistent among all of them is that the value should be in the context of an arm's length transaction. And then the looking at the slide, the fourth area, which is consistent with the general market value of the subject transaction. Again, it's, it's important that what's being valued is specific to in the subject transaction. And frankly, in some cases, we are involved in helping parties define, well, what is the subject transaction and what does it look like and what is the contemplated business uh, and for purposes of the transaction, what assets and liabilities are included and specifically what are excluded? Because again, what good is evaluation if it misses the mark? Uh, or in terms of a management services agreement, if there's not a definition around the underlying requirements and what services are should be performed, then uh, it's really difficult to value what the fair market value of those services should be if they're not even defined. Um, so that's the the key takeaways is that, number one, the valuation, uh, these various definitions are consistent across all three areas, but specific to equipment and office space, there's some additional commentary that is provided or different requirements, not just commentary, different requirements under equipment and office space. 
as, as noted on the slide. Rachel, Perfect. Anything else? That. No, the only item that I really think is vital is that it, it blows my mind that people would try and value something as a hypothetical when there is an actual transaction in place, right? And so from a legal standpoint, why wouldn't you make it as close to the transaction as possible by building in reasonable assumptions, which are part of a valid methodology and valuation model versus just doing a hypothetical, which may or may not relate to the transaction. Completely agree. And if you actually were to go one slide back, just very briefly to the IRS definition, which the IRS definition actually does invoke the term hypothetical, but that's in the context of a hypothetical willing uh, buyer and willing seller. It's not necessarily hypothetical transaction, but that's just it, in essence, it's kind of blind to who is the buyer and who is the seller, uh, but it's certainly not blind to the underlying transaction, even under the IRS definition. So if we could maybe move on then. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think in, on this slide, again, we have assets, compensation, and again, this is general market value versus fair market value. But the key term that really jumped out at me here is, the date of acquisition of the asset as a result of bona fide bargaining between a well-informed buyer and seller that are not in a position to generate business for each other. Correct. Um, right. And maybe John, the only other Do you thing want to I take might... over commercially reasonable? Sure. The only thing I might add is that the previous definition uh, added some additional language to the fair market to the general market value that has now been uh, excluded from the new definition. Other than that, the definitions are are synonymous. Um, okay, so under the commercial reasonableness, uh, frankly, I'm very <laughs> from a valuation perspective, I'm uh, I'm quite pleased with the the language and the commentary and the guidance now provided for this whole concept of commercially reasonable prior to the new rules coming out there really wasn't a define a definition provided in the code now there is and so i'll take a quick moment to just read through this so commercially reasonable means that the particular arrangement furthers a legitimate business purpose of the parties to the arrangement and is sensible, considering the characteristics of the parties, including their size, type, scope, and specialty. An arrangement may be commercially reasonable even if it does not result in profit for one or more of the parties, which uh, that last sentence I know has been an issue in various matters or engagements that we've been involved in that, you know, how can it, how can the arrangement be commercially reasonable, not medically, but commercially reasonable if it produces losses and is expected to in the future. So I think uh, some some black and white guidance is here. I say black and white because there is additional language um, within the rules and regulations that basically says that uh, it's not, however, uh, irrelevant uh, the issue of profitability, that that is something that should still at least be considered in the overall framework of commercial reasonableness. Um, there's also some additional language that goes to types of arrangements that uh, the government believes might indicate more of a commercially reasonable arrangement. So th those could be whenever um, there, the arrangement involves uh, meeting some kind of a requirement like EMTALA or the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act. In other words, the arrangement is intended to be compliant with other requirements that the healthcare provider should be uh, uh, aiming to achieve. Also, for the provision of charity care, by its nature, is often a money-losing arrangement. Um, so, 
um, if there's also a community need and, and, and also if the arrangement is providing timely access to healthcare services. So there is some additional, which I believe begins uh, on or around page uh, 77531 in the Federal Register Volume 85, which was issued on December the 2nd, 2020. Uh, so certainly suggest that the folks uh, refer to that. Also, a couple of other quick comments that were also made is that the determination of commercial reasonableness is not one evaluation, uh, which is interesting, um, uh, but that it should also, that the determination should be made from the perspective of the particular parties involved in the arrangement. All right. Uh, in regards to applicable laws and how it impacts the valuation, I made the comment earlier that the assumption when we do evaluation is that the business model or the underlying arrangement uh, is legally permissible and that it meets various uh, requirements, including uh, various safe harbors or exceptions. Uh, so that's it's it's important that we work hand in hand with legal advisors to um, to try to make sure that is in fact the case. Yeah, I Anything think this slide that? sums it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it just sums up everything that we've discussed, Don, from there have to be buyers of healthcare entities basically required to comply with the framework and it takes a team of knowledgeable attorneys and knowledgeable valuation experts in order to execute this in a manner that mitigates everyone's risk. Right. And one really quick example is that, you know, fair market value should be fair market value regardless on who's paying it. And there is some comments that regardless if a physician's being paid by a private equity owned entity or by a physician practice um, or by a hospital, if they're employed by a hospital, that the compensation should not be different across all three of those types of employers. If fair market value of the services should be basically agnostic to who the employer is. Um, okay. Absolutely. So now the False Claims Act and implications of the new final rules, this, as Don indicated for finance and accounting, is a separate course in and of itself, but we're just going to hit the highlights for you and then give some retrospective laws and a little insight into areas to watch as people look for violations of these new final rules. So basically, for the fiscal year ending 2020, the DOJ recovered over $2.2 billion. $1.8 billion involved fraud from the healthcare industry. That does not include Medicaid. In fact, the Medicaid report was just issued by HHS OIG, and there's was fairly close. I believe it was $875 million just for Medicaid dollars, but again, that's separate from what DOJ recovered. Uh, 1.6 were a result of what are known as key TOM, key TAM, or whistleblower lawsuits. The False Claims Act continues to serve as the government's primary civil tool to redress false claims for federal funds, which is what we mentioned earlier with those submission of claims and the attestation on the back of the claim forms, as well as the provider agreements with CMS. And not surprisingly, over fiscal year 2020, the largest recoveries came from the drug industry, as well as illegal payment of patient co-pays. So the FCA's history, it's known as the Lincoln Law. It actually stems back to 1863. There have been what are known as two major statutory amendments, one in 1943 and one in 1986. The amendments that came in 1986 led to the increase of whistleblower lawsuits by private entities and counsel. It's important to note that a pro se plaintiff cannot proceed without an attorney 
in a false claims act case so either the individual needs to be an attorney or they need to hire an attorney because in essence whenever i file these cases i'm standing in the shoes of the government so to speak and if the government declines and myself and my co-counsel move forward with litigation the government always remains an interested party another key two key laws uh, were one, the Fraud Enforcement Recovery Act of 2009, and FERA is import important for a couple of reasons. First, it was a bipartisan effort between Senator Grassley and Senator Schumer. Secondly, the FERA amendments to the FCA expand exposure to FCA investigations and claims. Next, FERA provided the DOJ with expanded tools to conduct civil investigations into possible healthcare fraud. One of these tools is known as a civil investigative demand. And lastly, it also helped with a new provision known as a reverse false claim. The Affordable Care Act did a couple of items which are positive for whistleblowers as well as the government. The public disclosure bar, first and foremost, the ACA amendment indicated that a relator's allegations may be based on secondhand information provided those allegations add to the information already contained in the public sphere. However, defense counsel will typically argue that original source is still argued as being necessary. The False Claims Act and the Dodd-Frank whistleblower program are more divergent in this area, so you need to read both of those if you're looking to Don's point earlier, the publicly traded company or another entity which falls under the SEC's umbrella. The next item that's important is what's known as the 60-day rule. Overpayments that are not reported in return within 60 days are in fact considered an obligation under the False Claims Act and are the basis for civil monetary penalties. And for each part of Medicare, of which there's part A, B, C and D, there are separate regulations regarding the 60-day rule for each of those different parts. Don, do you have anything else related to this uh, before I let you tackle these mm -hmm. key cases for Stark Law violations? No, I don't believe I do. So I think we're ready to maybe jump into these key cases. Um, and these have obviously been around for a while, so they're, while they're nothing new, I still think they're important lessons to keep in mind. So under Toomey, the, one of the core issues in that matter involved physicians, uh, orthopedic surgeons that were employed on a part-time basis, yet their compensation um, did not basically adjust for that. So this kind of goes to the concept that we've already discussed, that the FMB should be consistent with the specific subject arrangement, not some kind of a hypothetical arrangement. Uh, the second bullet-pointed case involving Carlisle uh, HMA goes to making sure that you have a good uh, process and controls in place for arrangements that have been updated or that have been renewed that particularly when the underlying terms of the arrangement have been changed and expanded that the valuation be updated to adjust for the changes to the underlying agreement again it goes to the kind of the core issue of the valuation and the arrangement should match the specific uh, arrangement that the parties are entering into. Under Bradford, this was a, a pretty interesting matter in that one of the core problems was that the, the this involved a sublease arrangement for a nuclear camera that the hospital was leasing from a physician practice. And in addition to paying for the use of the camera, the hospital paid a significant and much more larger amount for a non-compete for the physicians to not then use the nuclear camera in a competitive manner against the hospital. 
and the valuation uh, that was performed was directly capturing the volume and value of the um, lost nuclear procedures that the group would be foregoing. So while the particular valuation method that the valuation expert used is consistent with industry practice, it was uh, in conflict with the volume and value requirement specific to healthcare issues, which also kind of goes to making sure that the valuation expert that you're using is knowledgeable uh, and isn't using uh, methods that might be applicable in industry standard in non-healthcare matters, but to use them in a healthcare matter may trip up um, and violate the rules uh, regarding uh, issues specific to healthcare arrangements. Anything to add to those, Rachel? The one, the two items I wanted to hone in on relate to Toomey. This is probably one of the most notable Stark cases that has ever been decided. And a couple of key aspects of that case were A, the settlement was for $237 million. It was upheld by the Fourth Circuit as such. And one aspect that really jumped out at me was that the agreement between the hospital and the physicians was for 10 years without any ongoing fair market value or commercial reasonableness valuations. Right. Another item that we've heard the term volume or value of referrals, and as Don indicated before, it was really intertwined with fair market value and general market value, but in these final rules, it was parsed out. And in fact, I looked at the final rules earlier this morning, and for the Stark final rules, volume or value is mentioned over 300 times. Wow. Yeah. So it's definitely an area to hone in on. And fundamentally, that's something that everyone should be very conscientious of whenever they are looking at how profits are going to be generated or revenues are going to be generated. Is the individual physician buying into this? or given the opportunity to be part of a certain arrangement only because their volume of patients or the value they bring to the arrangement, all of those are areas that should be considered as well. Don, as part of our takeaways, I think I'll take a couple and then leave the rest to you. It's always imperative to read and understand the regulations and these regulations in particular are ones that I have no doubt and I'm sure Don will attest to where we will go back and read and reread just because of the vastness and the changes to these two very important laws. As we've both indicated, it's necessary to engage competent and knowledgeable professionals to formulate a team. You wanna be conscientious and conscious of the shelf life of the valuation. And Don, do you wanna to speak to that before delving into some of the other items? Sure. So the shelf life goes to, in essence, how long is a valuation good for, or, or how long is it valid? And technically speaking, it's like a lot of things in our business world, it's really technically good as of the date of the valuation itself. And one might say, well, then how good is it if tomorrow it's no longer valid? And, and so it really goes to how volatile is the uh, business environment, the competitive environment, regulatory environment, economic environment, all these different things that can have an impact on the arrangement. How volatile are those underlying factors? And in some cases, we have clients that may want appraisals done every year uh, because they happen to be in a highly competitive marketplace with their arrangement. In other cases, they're more comfortable with maybe a two or three year time frame or 
that can be based on as a, an arrangement is being renewed or a new arrangement is being entered into with, uh, with, with, with another party. So it, it, it really, it's not up to the appraiser, in my opinion, it's up to management making a decision how much risk do are they likely to are, are they willing to take on in terms of whether the valuation is applicable or not? For, for a lot of my clients that do healthcare transactions, they a lot of times want the appraisal done within say 180 days to one year of the underlying transaction as a general rule. But if that particular business that they're looking at buying went through dramatic changes in the last three months, then maybe that's even shortened um, and, and, and looked at again even sooner. Uh, so it just goes to how dynamic and volatile the underlying business uh, is or the underlying arrangement. Any questions on that? Uh, Rachel, do you have similar issues from a legal standpoint on that topic? Absolutely, and I think that goes back to Toomey. And also what we've seen in other more recent cases, such as Tennant, who was held accountable by the DOJ for skewing the fair market value. I've also seen instances where entities entered into contracts even before the financial crisis of 2008, and it was six to eight years until after that before they actually redid another valuation which to me seems preposterous in light of a major market condition. And I'm sure you may be seeing this now on the valuation side with the pandemic. Are you getting more requests for updated valuations on commercial space? Uh, for, oh, for real estate? Uh, for real estate arrangements? Yes, in fair market value or lease agreements between physicians or practices and health systems, for example? Uh, correct. And, and actually, uh, in, in some cases, particularly in the early part of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, healthcare systems were interested in at least considering uh, arrangements that might delay, defer, or postpone rental arrangements with their underlying tenant physicians just as a way to provide relief because those tenants were experiencing major disruptions to their business. So, so yes, we were certainly working with, with clients on that. Now, going back to Toomey, if we were to compare, say, real estate lease arrangements, which it's not uncommon for those to be medium to longer term in nature, but usually those might embed some kind of an escalation for uh, annual rental payments. Um, and, and again, you're talking about real estate versus the more dynamic world of, say, physician compensation um, that has uh, all kinds of competitive market uh, factors that can impact the compensation today versus five years in the future of what that comp. And again, specific to the arrangement, to the physicians and to the hospital that's, that's, that's uh, involved. <clears throat> I, I think another great point with COVID is that HHS OIG, as well as CMS, did release what are known as waivers under 1135, and that enables certain exceptions to be implemented during the pandemic alone, and one of those was the fair market value or lease rates, where you could have it for a short period of time, Don, to your point, to make sure that perhaps offices didn't have to close so they could reduce the rent for a set period of time and not be in violation of the law, even if it wasn't necessarily at fair market value. But as soon as the waivers are no longer effective, entities absolutely need to make sure that they are at whatever the current fair market value is. Excellent point. That's an excellent point. And then because, move... Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. No, go ahead, Don. No, no, I was going to simply say is that make sure that's on your radar screen if you have clients that have entered into these temporary uh, arrangements because, you know, if the waiver is expired or been terminated, then, um, you know, then the underlying arrangement itself needs to revert back to fair market value or, or the prior arrangement. Uh, 
uh, the, the, the prior price involved. Absolutely. And then just moving through our other items very quickly, we've obviously highlighted value-based metrics and value-based payments for outcomes and the need for objective and measurable data, just as if one were valuing a real estate, a lease, or even a medical directorship. Payments for improvement in cost or quality should be rebased annually. You always want to be cautious of compensation tied to maintenance goals. An exception on the VBE and volume or value that one should be aware of is that as long as it is related solely to the target patient population, the volume or value prohibition does not apply. It's very limited, and again, to Don's point, you have to make sure that you are fitting squarely within the framework that CMS or HHSOIG has prescribed uh, with these laws. Don, do you want to take the last two? Sure. I think the last two um, involves uh, if the physician takes on downside risk, it may support higher compensation. And that kind of goes to an underlying premise in valuation, which is the higher the risk, um, then the more a party should potentially be compensated for that because the party is taking on you know, more risk and volatility than otherwise. Um, the last bullet uh, includes safeguards for quality and arrangements focused on cost savings. I think the concern there is that costs are being uh, generated at perhaps the expense of patient care being performed. Um, so I, there, there should be safeguards in place that don't allow that. That again, we're ultimately trying to make sure patients are receiving high quality care, but certainly not at the expense of withholding care from the patients. Absolutely. And with that, uh, Catherine, thank you again for having Don and I here today. We'd like to take any questions that you may have or the audience may have. Well, thank you so much, Don and Rachel. That was very, very inclusive and uh, pretty very much appreciate that. So we do have um, a few uh, questions here. What was the driving force behind the changes found in the Stark Law and AKS final rules? Don, do you want me to start and then you can add on to sure. the premise? Okay, great. So as we discussed, the driving force was really twofold. It was the shift in payment systems going away from a quantity-based system towards a quality of care-based system, which focused on the coordination of patient care as well as patient outcomes. Don? No, I, I think that's very well said. About all I would say is it, it, it permits the parties to have an alignment of their interest and being able to collaborate to work together so that they can really focus on improving quality of care, uh, access to care, and, and hopefully also mitigating or reducing the cost of that care by working together. Okay, and um, I think we have a Another question or two here um, real quick. Um, is there only one way to structure a value-based enterprise of EBE or is there flex flexibility? Again, I'll start and then Don can add on to our general premise. There's more than one way to structure it and there is nothing that is expressly defined. There are a lot of factors to consider when structuring a VBE. You want to take into account the number of VBE participants and make sure that none of the participants are on the HHS OIG ineligible list. Second, you want to look at the types of participants they are. Are you dealing with a 
physician practice and a medical center, or are you dealing with a physician practice that owns a DME that fits within the exceptions? So there are a lot of factors to consider, and the more parties that are involved and the different types of parties that are involved. As an attorney, I would trend towards forming a separate legal entity, limiting the number of individuals who have contracting authority, as well as agency authority for the VBE. Don? Great points. Um, and probably just from a higher level, from a practical valuation perspective, um, I would want to have a firm understanding of what is the legitimate business purpose of the VBE, who are the parties that are involved, and are each of the folks that are involved, are they contributing meaningful, uh, meaningful, relevant services to the objectives of the VBE? And then is it all clearly laid out in the governing document um, in terms of who has control, what are the voting rights, um, and other pertinent issues? Okay, thank you. And uh, we're going to do just one more very quick question. Um, uh, I know there's uh, several differences between Stark Law Final Rule and AKS Final Rule, but what is one key difference? One key difference is that the AKS has criminal implications, and as it relates to the new final rules, from my perspective, one of the most pronounced differences is that ineligible list of VBE participants under the AKS, whereas the Stark Law doesn't have any ineligible participants. It's anyone. Don? Right. I, I agree with that. I think in the commentary, uh, Stark and AKS have tried, I think, their best to be on the same page and provide consistent guidance. Um, and, and when they vary, I think, that has also been pointed out within the rules and regulations and in, in the comments and responses to those. Uh, but I definitely agree that your example of the DBE participant is, is a really good example of how Stark uh, and AKS uh, have different definitions of the eligible DBE participants. Okay. All right. Well, I wanted to thank you both so much for being here today. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and and wrap up, but um, thank you both so much for being here today. I really appreciate it, and I know our attendees will um, will enjoy all this information as well. Thank you so much. Catherine, you're very welcome, and Rachel, thank you. It's always a pleasure to, to present with you as well. Don and Catherine, likewise, it's always my pleasure to present with both of you. And Catherine, thank you for having Don and I here today. We truly appreciate the opportunity. Well, I appreciate the opportunity as well. So thank you so much. And attendees, please use the information on the screen for any um, questions that you might have um, going forward. Um, and if you think of any further, um, you can send us questions and we'll forward them on. Please remember your PACOM and your PMI CEU certificate will be emailed to you from within two days following the broadcast. There's no need to request it. You can register for any future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at firsthcc.com or call us at 888-543-4778. And thank you for joining us.